Hello and welcome everyone. Um, I am Dr. Ashish Fadnis. I am the Director of Orthopedics and the Head Department of Orthopedics and Joint Replacement at Jupiter Hospital in Thane. We want to welcome you all to what we call as a revolution. Why do we call it a revolution? Today we are going to talk about a little bit about knee replacements and why the knee replacements are heading in the direction that they are. It is a very exciting period for a patient and a doctor because there is so much being done to ease the pain of the surgery, to ease uh, the process of the surgery and to make the whole experience not a very painful one. So the patients who have got pain in the knee and who have got arthritis of the knee, we go through a lot of phases from medications to injections to corrective surgeries and finally when nothing works and when they reach the end of their spectrum, it they require a knee replacement. So we say that they require a knee replacement when the joint is completely worn out and as you can see in a model here, the joint has become completely worn out and it becomes very rough. So once the joint becomes rough, we have to replace it with something which is very smooth. And unfortunately, we do not have anything as smooth, uh, man-made, which is mimicking the natural joint. So we have to rely on our engineers who have made a knee replacement for us. These knee replacement prosthesis is made of a metal. There is a plastic and there is a metal beneath and it is fixed with the help of cement. And this becomes a very smooth articulation which keeps on rubbing and the patient uses that. So this leads to the knee being completely straight, the deformity being corrected, the source of pain being abolished and therefore the patient can expect a good functioning knee, a good gait or a good posture to walk. So this was the whole idea why the knee replacements came in and why it became very popular, why it became successful. But what we had seen that not all knee replacements were successful. There were still a lot of people who used to complain of knee pain. There were still a fair amount of people who were not happy with their knee replacement. The problem is that the natural knee joint is a complex hinge joint and we are trying to replace that with a simple hinge joint. We are trying to sort of you know make something which is very simple which actually is very complex. And therefore there are these patients who are not very very happy. So what the, the next evolution in knee replacement was that we tried to do these knee replacements through a smaller through a smaller cut, keeping all the muscles intact, balancing the knees. The issue with the knee replacement was not only that there was metal which was rubbing against plastic, which led to the longevity. There were people who asked, what is the life of the knee replacement? There was a time when we used to say that the life of the knee replacement is about 15 or 20 years. It's about 15 or 20 million walking cycles and we do about 1 million walking cycles in a year. But now that thing has changed because the metallurgy has improved. We've got better bearing surfaces. We got better plastics which enable the joint to last long. But still there are a few patients who are not very very comfortable. And the reason for that is that we are trying to generalize something. We are trying to apply a certain rule to everyone. We are trying to say that this is the position of the knee. That is this is what you have to live with. This is what you're going to get. But patients are not very happy with that. We know that now every person is unique. Every knee is unique. Even the right knee doesn't follow the pattern of the left knee. Even both the knees are not affected to the same. And therefore, we started thinking of it in a different manner. What if we have patient specific solutions? What if uh, a particular patient doesn't follow the normal pattern? What if one person is different from the other? The bend of a knee, the balance of a knee is completely different to what the other person has. <clears throat> and therefore, we started coming up with the idea of a patient specific knee replacement. And this is where we used to get the knees 3D printed. So this actually is a 3D printed knee. So what we have done, the bioengineers for us, they have done is they have taken the patient's MRI scan, they have printed the patient's knee and they have given us a, a particular jig which fits onto the patient's knee when we are doing the surgery and enables us to do the surgery in the most accurate manner for that particular patient. So if the patient had a slight bend and he was going to live with that bend and if you correct him too much or correct him too little, he is not going to like that. So therefore, this was something which was called as a patient specific knee replacement. Now this patient specific knee replacement 
this jigs and this 3d printed knees they enable me to give solutions or to come up with solution which is very specific for a particular patient but whether i have ex I have executed the surgery in the same manner we could not judge so that it was not possible for us to cross check whether what we have done is what the patient is lying with so therefore in the mid 2000 uh 12 to 2015 this was very popular and slowly slowly this sort of you know evolved into something else we recognized that the patients more patients are happy having a patient specific knee replacement but there are still a subset of patient where we could there was space for improvisation we could improve slightly and this space was then filled with computer navigation so navigation like our google maps tells us where we want to go or sort of you know it guides us where we want to go so if there is if you have to go from point a to point b the google maps or any particular navigation will tell you the correct route to go there but what it does not do is, is when once you go off road or once you take a detour it gets you back on the same track unfortunately with surgery that can be a bit of a problem that once you are not accurate then getting you back onto a correct alignment may be a little bit difficult so there was still processes in which the, uh, these surgical procedures were evolving in the meanwhile what happened in the meanwhile what we did was we relooked at our pain modalities we relooked at our uh, rehabilitation protocols the exercises that we are doing the aggressiveness with which we are trying to get the patient out of the hospital we started relooking at all that and we came up with this uh, pathway called eras enhanced recovery after surgery so this was a combination of the anesthetists the physiotherapists the surgeons they all coming together to ensure that the patient's physiology or a natural um, process is least disturbed and therefore uh, it gives a very optimum outcome to the patient as he undergoes a, a surgery so now we have a patient specific instrumentation we have a specific pathway for the particular patient and then we have eras so all in all the hospitalization decreased the aggressiveness with which we sort of started mobilizing the patient that became faster and ultimately it gave a better experience to enhance this still further and to make this process seamless and to make this process uh, predictable for every particular patient so that the unhappy outcomes or um, what would say the outliers are minimized we have something which is called as a robotic arm assisted surgery now this robotic arm assisted surgery is basically a robotic arm that we use while we are to performing the surgery now all of us have mobile phones on which we are playing games and we can tilt the mobile phone in which are manner and then the screen responds we tilt the screen we we use this mobile phones to play a lot of games and there are these sensitive accelerometers which are um, built in the mobile phones which have now been imbibed the technology which is there in the ps3s and in the xboxes in the kinect technology all these have been imbibed in the surgical process to make uh, our life sort of you know more predictable to ensure that we give a good outcome and these are a part of the surgical armamentary so when i use a robotic arm not only the arm i tell the arm that this is where i want to head and it gives me a very accurate pathway to reach over there but what it also does is that this robotic arm would stop the moment it senses that i move or i deviate even a millimeter or 2 millimeters from the designed uh, pathway or designed outcome where i want to come so all in all this robotic surgery basically is it's once we finalize that this particular patient requires a particular outcome it requires a particular alignment and it requires a particular sort of you know balance the robotic surgery helps me do that now because of this our excessive uh damage to the soft tissues excessive moving around of the soft tissues longer incision short incision everything has stopped so therefore we are able to do these surgeries in a most accurate and a most sort of predictable manner by uh by smaller incision by using this robotic arm assisted devices these devices are uh sort of you know coming into every household as i can say uh are coming into every operation theater there was a time when we used to have portable x ray machines which were uh, sort of a, you know at a premium or not many people had that but now it is the norm and i think the robotic surgery probably is going to be the norm so what uh, i'm so these robotic surgeries also uh, help in two other manners is one is a it does not let me deviate from the surgical path that i have chosen for the patient it makes it very predictable for the particular patient 
and it makes the soft tissue sort of you know handling uh, the bleeding and uh, the retraction to a minimum and therefore it sort of ensures that the patient's pain requirement is less. Now due to COVID we all knew that you know there is something which is called as an inflammation. <clears throat> What this inflammation does is basically it releases a lot of enzymes, it releases a lot of substances in our system, you know, it releases a lot of uh, enzymes in the system which cause a lot of pain. Now, in our study, when we moved in the last 10 years from 3D printed knees to the eye assist or the handheld navigation which I just mentioned to a robotic surgery, what we have found is that these robotic instruments and use of this robotic technology decreases the inflammation a lot thereby also decreasing the patient's need for painkillers. So lesser need for painkillers, lesser need for medications, and therefore the patient is less drug, as we can say, or less dependence on opioids. And therefore, they, overall, they are quite fresh. Overall, they get a good outcome. And they are more amenable to sort of, you know, get out of bed, start walking soon, um, listen to the physiotherapy, uh, and comply with the physiotherapy instructions. So our duration of hospitalization has gone down, but what is more important is that patients are doing much more during this period than what they would have done otherwise. To illustrate, I would say that, you know, this is what we say is a robotic arm. And there are a few reflector beads that will be, uh, that will be attached. So instead of using a saw or a blade, this at the end has a very small pointed curve. Now this is a probe which tells you that these are the instruments which are as fine as these. This probe sort of, you know, whenever I'm in the field, it juts out and it, you know, retracts back the moment it senses that I'm out of the field. So these arms and these devices are extremely sensitive. They're more sensitive than what the systems that we know of and they're extremely highly responsive. What is best is that they are married with certain joints. So the system that we have here, which I have showed you, is married to a particular joint which has stood the test of time. It has stood the test of time for the last 15 to 20 years. We know how the joint behaves. We have full faith in the uh, joint or uh, the components that I have shown. And this, along with the patient-specific technology, along with the robotic surgery, overall makes it a very happy outcome. This is a completely new way of looking at joint replacements. This is a completely sort of a, uh, I would say, a beginning of a new era where affordable treatment is coming home, is coming to your doorstep and to ensure one step closer to what we would call the perfect outcome that this surgery is predictably good and a good outcome in almost 95 to 100% of the patients. There are certain complications or certain problems which are not related to the alignment issues or not related to the uh, Sort of, you know, the issues that were alluded to earlier. There could be issues with uh, infections, there could be issues with fractures or clots forming in the leg, which are also existing, which the navigation or the robotic will not address. But however, the percentage of these complications will be drastically down if we sort of, you know, have a technology like this, which is very, very um, predictable very easy to um, ascertain and very, very easy to sort of, you know, uh, reproduce. And also in any hands, it doesn't require a lot of learning. Curve. So if you have a, uh, a system that is coming in, because we are quite adept to the technology, because we have imbibed it very early, we can take to it and you can apply it to our patient care uh, very easily. So there's a question here, how do we evaluate if the patient needs a conventional robotic surgery? In my opinion, now, with the advent of these robotic systems, uh, preferably every patient should get a robotic surgery in the future. We are still in a very nascent stage. This has come, let's say the early robotics have come around 30 to 14 years back. The, there's a big wave in uh, sort of, you know, um, accepting this particular technology among surgeons and being having confidence in, that, uh, in the system and passing it on to the patients now in the last one or two years, especially around the pandemic and a couple of years before that. The early reports and the literature and the papers are coming after uh, uh, looking at these particular joint replacements across the joint registries, which is showing that the robotic surgeon clearly has an advantage over conventional, especially in reproducing the results that we are interested in. So in my opinion, I foresee a time, maybe a couple of years or three, four years down the line, where probably every surgery is going to be a robotic surgery. 
these robotic surgeries are also going to evolve. This is the second first generation of robots. So tomorrow, this is called as real intelligence that we, the surgeon tells the robot what it wants to do and the robot arm helps him execute that. Tomorrow with the advent of artificial intelligence, this might be refined even a little bit more. So this is just a first step in evolution. I think we are looking at a very, very um, exciting new time and a lot of sort of, you know, these technologies are going to flood the market, they're going to come in the market, which are going to be easily uh, acceptable for the doctor and the patient. And also this competition is going to make it a little bit more affordable. So uh, eventually I foresee that every patient uh, who is uh, suited for a conventional knee replacement will also be suited for a robotic knee replacement. There are some special situations where robotic is definitely more uh, advantageous. If the patient has, has had a few surgeries before, if the patient has got pre-existing implants inside, where it precludes us or it stops us from using conventional um, sort of uh, uh, instruments. So if that is the case, then the robotic will help because it becomes very, uh, very accurate. Now there is another question, is, there, is it more beneficial for younger uh, patients? Yes. Definitely, I would recommend for a younger patient. So all our 3D printed guides, our eye assist uh, uh, jigs or the newer technologies, navigation we have used, we have used it more aggressively in the younger patients. Now, why so younger? Because a younger patient is a more demanding patient. The younger patient is going to live with the joint for a much longer time. The average life expectancy in our country is about 84 years. So if we have a patient who's about 54 or let's say 60, who requires a joint replacement, we would call that patient a young patient. We would want to execute the surgery in a most accurate manner so that the chances of loosening of sort of, uh, sort of, you know, we would want to balance it well so that the patient can use uh, the knee in a normal gait, in a normal manner, have a good length, does not have any limb, does not have any skip or jump when he is uh, using the sort of knee replacement. It does not load, it loads very nicely. So basically, this is what I wanted to tell is that if the alignment is perfect, the knee is balanced well. But if the alignment is not perfect, then you can see that a particular point, it is loading and then this knee is going to wear out faster. If the knee rocks, if the knee's balance is not well, then it is going to be a problem. So therefore, this knee, this metal will rub against the plastic and then this plastic will wear out and this eventually would make the prosthesis loose. So these chances are higher in patients who are uh, younger. So therefore, we would be uh, more sort of you know aggressive in advocating uh, a robotic sort of arm assisted surgery for the younger patient so that we can give them a good outcome, a better alignment, a better experience so that they can live with the processes longer and utilize it in the most accurate manner. So all in all, this is, um, as I said, so there are a few components to this processes, uh, to this procedure. So what happens is that when we perform this surgery, we initially tell the computer, tell the robot what, where is the position of the knee, how the knee looks like, and what are the sort of bone defects, which way the bone is curving, what are the sort of, you know, size and different, different landmarks. Based on that, it calculates a particular center. It calculates an axis around which the knee is uh, moving around. These calculations were a bit inaccurate in the previous generation, which have now been corrected and they are more and more accurate now. They have been compared with CT, scan, uh, CT scans of the same patients. They have been compared with MRI scans and the technology is becoming more and more predictable. And this is why this generation of robotics is sort of more responsive and much more easier. What it is also helping in a big manner, which uh, we are all interested in, is it is uh, enabling us to sort of, you know, preserve, even preserve a part of the knee. Now, this might sound a bit ironic that we are going to do a knee replacement. You're going to replace the knee, then how can it preserve? So there are certain types of knee replacement, which are called as half knee replacements or unicompartmental knee replacements. Now, the unicompartmental knee replacement traditionally were not looked upon very favorably because the chances of failure of a unicompartmental knee replacement meant that the patient had to now undergo a total knee replacement or a redo joint replacement. So, the success of the unicompartmental knee replacement was not as reproducible as the total knee replacement. But with the help of these robotic tools, with the help of these really accurate instruments, the success or the predictability of the unicompartmental needs is also good and therefore more and more surgeons will be confident in offering that 
uh, option to the patients uh, with a confidence that they can give a better result or they can give a good result. So if you have a unique compartmental knee replacement, the chance that uh, the patient would be able to bend more, patient will be able to have a more natural gait, it, he would be have, able to do more number of activities is much higher. So Dinesh John asked how long would it take for the revolution to take over? I think it all depends on how, uh, so, so th this is a slightly philosophical take that I have over these robotic arm assisted surgeries, you know, all these robotic arm assisted surgeries are uh, sort of propagated by the big four. There are four or five big companies which have married the robot to a particular system. So right now I'm using the robot so I can use only their particular joint. I don't have the liberty to use it for anyone. So it is not like an Android platform where developers can develop any software or apps around that and then the technology becomes over. So I would like the robotic companies or I would like this technology to be an open source so that more and more people can apply their brains, more and more people can sort of utilize this technology and apply it to the, uh, the overall population as such. You know, why should someone be uh, bereft or someone be not accessible accessing this technology just because it's, if it's like expensive or it is not available in that country or let's say it's not available in that part of the country where the support is not there. I think this should be this uh, robotic arm assisted uh, platforms or robotic systems should be an open source where everyone can sort of you know take part in development and sort of propagation of these technology and applications to uh, all the patients in the future. Just like artificial intelligence and uh, AI algorithms are affecting every aspect of healthcare, this robotic will also affect every aspect of joint replacement or every aspect of healthcare. So I think it's just a matter of time. Uh, India has grown very exponentially. If I would say that, you know, three, four years back, we had maybe one or two robots. Now suddenly there is a spot probably around 200 or so robotic arm assisted sort of devices of different, different companies would be there all across the country. So we are a country which is very tech savvy. Uh, we are quite leading in accepting technology as a part uh, for uh, healthcare and therefore I would really see that the next year or two we would see a lot more robotic arm assisted surgeries than what uh, is happening right now. So maybe five years down the line we will be wiser whether we do the right step. But I am sure in the natural history of progression, in the natural sort of you know development, this is only going to be a positive step. I don't see a flip side. Because at every stage, yes, at the moment, the human mind or the surgeon can still have a choice whether he wants to overrun, he wants to cross check, he wants to go back a couple of steps and then check if whatever is heading is heading in the right direction. So what are the results compared to the conventional? Anywhere it has been normally used or asked to take the surgery to, anywhere it has been normally used or asked to take the surgery to all. Right, so results compared to the conventional, see, I would say, uh, in joint replacements, when you talk about whether it has really made a lot of difference or not, we are talking in terms of 5, 5 or 10, 10 years. We are talking about the longevity of the joint which is about more than 20 years. So after, as I said, after 5 years or 10, 6 years down the line, we would really see that whether uh, we have made a difference. Now I would like to make a, a slight comment or a point here because most of the people who are listening are non-orthopedic guys, is that when we follow up our patients, we ask them how are things uh, you know, progressing with them. What are they able to do? Can they sit in a car? Can they get out of a car? Is there any difficulty uh, doing puja, walking in the kitchen, climbing up and down stairs? And there are a few tests like we ask them to get out of the chair. So the chair to stand up time should be less than two seconds. There is, there are, there is a six minute walk test and we see how the patients are uh, walking or timed up and go test. So there is a gait analysis. So in the last 10 years in Jupiter Hospital, we have got a very you know good 3D gait analysis uh, lab where we have force plates, we have we, where we measure the patient's cadence, the step distance, step length, the velocity with which the patient walk, the confidence, the way he the patient sway, the way the patient shifts weight. So we've been studying them, and I can say that there is definitely a progression by adopting these 3D printed technologies, eye assist and robotic, towards a better gait in all the patients. So there are some patients who are obese, there are some patients who are rheumatoid arthritis, there are patients who are elderly, who are young. But what we have found that using this technology sort of, you know, gives you more predictable results that all of them will do equally well or all of them are sort of in a particular zone that you would want them to be. If you draw a Bell's curve, there will be some outliers. Some have done exceedingly well, some have done exceedingly poorly. But that Bell's curve 
is, is sort of narrowed down and most of the people stay around the median. If you ask me, conventional knee replacements require a lot of extensive uh, sort of, you know, steps while we are doing the surgery. These are completely abolished when we use a uh, robotic surgery. So the early results, if I have to say, in the, in the first year or two, they are all do, to do with the early outcomes. So the early outcomes are comparable. They're definitely not worse. They're better. The inflammatory parameters which we use like CRP or TNF or uh, uh, the white cell count, following the surgery are much better in the robotic assisted as compared to a convention. The other thing is that uh, when they did a study on use of navigation and giving the navigation and these aids to medical students as compared to experienced surgeons, they said that, okay, these are the saw bones. This is what you need to do. Go on and get on with the surgery and do it. And what they found was the final year medical students and the professors, they all produce results which are more and more sort of, you know, in the same median. So the results as compared to the conventional are definitely going to be better because the surgeon can cross check at every stage. He knows where he's going to head to and it has been shown that they all form the, we decrease the number of outliers. So that is all I can say at the moment about the results as compared to the conventional. The other question that we get uh, asked is that, uh, does it take a lot of time? So it used to take a lot of time uh, as I, and it used to take a lot of time in the older generation of robotics. But so as the surgeon gets, you know, a hang of the system, as we get used to a new phone or a newer technology, you become very fast with it. So similarly, we have become very fast with it. If you say, if you see the modern technology, it doesn't add on too much time. So what do the surgeons do? What do we do to sort of, you know, uh, get over the learning curve? We attend sawbone workshops. We go to cadaver courses and we have done a few knee replacements on the cadavers on the sawbone before we actually uh, include it in, uh, in our first patient. So visiting centers of excellence where uh, other people have done this, going to centers where this technology has sort of, you know, taken birth or to the companies where the engineers can talk to the surgeon and say that, you know, these are the glitches that you can come out. If these are the glitches, then this is the fail safe mechanism or this is how you sort of can uh, come overcome that. There's a question here. What about rehabilitation differences, right? So this is a question asked by Aquile Physiotherapy, right? So re this is a very interesting question, uh, rehabilitation differences. So what you would find is that the uh, rehabilitation hopefully should be easier. Now, because you're a physiotherapist, ask this question, I would say that, uh, let's say this is a this is a, a knee replacement and that's the lateral collateral, one uh, lateral collateral ligament and a medial collateral ligament. So the preoperative, if the knee had a certain deformity, like you see that the knee had a certain deformity and to correct the deformity, we had to sort of you know, adjust the tension of these ligaments by doing some maneuvers and getting these ligaments perfectly balanced. So what the robotic is doing us, it is enabling us to get a perfect balance in the ligaments, a perfect alignment in the coronal plane, a perfect flexion extension without having uh, to do too much with the soft tissues. Now, because there is less soft tissue handling, therefore the corollary will be the there is not much of sort of you know muscle contusion, muscle laceration, muscle cutting. These are all uh, sort of surgeries which have been done with minimal tissue handling. In fact, for a conventional knee replacement, if you require two assistants with the robotic arm assisted, you require just one assistant and that too when we are cementing. So most of the time, this surgery is done by the surgeon who is sort of you know holding the knee and performing the surgery using his jig or bird. The other thing is that uh, we used to use saws which were very violent or with not violent I would say it, they were very sort of you know damaging to the bone. So this burr is very gentle it's just a 5 millimeter burr and therefore the pain which is generated by burring of these bones is also much lesser. So uh, I would say it is still early days for me to say what uh, differences it has made but definitely I can say that the patients in the hospital are doing much more much earlier. So return to function is much easier much faster. At the end of the surgery, we'll be able to tell you what is the range that we have achieved in terms of an you know, objective format. We give a report, we give an objective format, and that format is something that you can reproduce. Okay, this patient had no flexion deformity, this patient had a complete bend, this patient had a perfect balance. So yes, you would be able to do one, two, three, four, five activities within one, two, three, four, five times. Of course, every patient is different. The body habitus is different, and that is what we will have to see and how we evolve.
So um, the next step in rehabilitation is whether the patients Right. So the next step in, in uh, continuing with rehabilitation, you will say that, you know, uh, does the patient climb upstairs much earlier? So if we are doing both the knee replacements, then we would sort of, you know, want to uh, make sure that the patient is able to go to the washroom, go to the toilet, do the activities on our own and climb up and down stairs. Uh, at least one flight of stairs before the patient uh, goes home. So uh, Dinesh says, well, reversal are a better side. Hope it takes less time to be operational and results are maximum. Yes, I mean, we surely hope so that these results are predictable and in everyone's hands, you know. So it should not matter whether the patient is, let's say, in Amravati or Nanded or in Bombay or in Sindhudur. They should really have a similar sort of outcome. We see it for fractures, hip fractures, spine fractures. They have been operated everywhere. There are image intensifiers. There are sort of laminar airflow threaters in every nook and corner of the country. So why should this robotic surgery is not be in every corner of the country? We use image intensifiers, we use digital x-rays, which has become the standard of care. So why should the robotic surgery in the future not be standard of care? So at the moment, yes, it's a new technology. That's the reason why it's expensive. But the moment people and surgeons, they all accept that. The insurance companies, they all sort of, uh, sort of you know, reimbursing the claims or it becomes a standard of care. The costs are going to come down. And yes, the, the difference will happen probably if it becomes an open source. So right now, uh, I don't think it is. we are looking at that. I, I think a lot of companies are putting a lot of thought and research into developing newer systems, uh, which are sort of, you know, which are having an edge over each other. Every system has got some advantages and some disadvantages. Now, there are some, to tell you the smaller differences, there are some systems in the market which require to have a patient's CT scan. These are the systems which do not require to have a patient CT scans. So a CT scan was an older generation of system where you would have the patient CT scan, the perfect alignment, and then you would match to what you see uh, during the surgery. These definitely have certain advantages, but the natural progression was a CT free because we would want to go to a system where we would not want to expose the patient to any further radiation or do no harm, you know, not, not giving the patient any more trouble than the, what the patient is already in. There are sort of, you know, studies which are going on whether we can recreate the patient's three-dimensional model based on the patient's, you know, scan or the whole x-ray. So a lot of these things are being developed in the background. We are moving away from CT scans. We are moving towards decrease in the cost of healthcare. And hopefully they should let us do that. Right. So, uh, Coming back to rehabilitation, there are now these rehabilitating aids. So a lot of physiotherapists are also imbibing a sort of a, you know, this pandemic forced a lot of physios to, uh, or let's say, uh, they explored a newer avenue of sort of remote physiotherapy. You would see the patient once and the next exercises would be given on teleconsult or you would watch the patient do certain exercises, give them particular corrections and, uh, you know, try to achieve the result. As we studied this over the last two years, we actually found that the patients and the physios both are very happy. It is possible for the physio to give the same amount of time with the patient over teleconsultation, trying to correct a posture, shoulder rehab or the knee rehab, exactly watching it on the screen like you're watching uh, someone on the screen right now. So the physio has evolved. The other thing that has evolved uh, over time is a adoption of these uh, app-based technologies by the rehab specialist, physiotherapist and the patients. So there are a lot of app-based systems where the physios can track how many steps the patient has taken, what uh, sort of exercises the patient has done. These are now also tracked with the hospital, with the surgeon. So even the joint replacement surgeon has an app. So even though the patient has sort of gone, so we send someone home to remove the stitches. We send someone home to sort of, you know, do the physiotherapist. But in the future, I would say that even the physiotherapist would not be that uh, you know, aggressive. They would teach the patient and sort of remotely, they can uh, objectively see what sort of bend the patient had. Now, iPhones, uh, Samsung phones, they all have a uh, what we call a goniometer device. A goniometer is a meter which calculates the exact range of movement, the exact balance. Physiotherapists are now use, utilizing mobile phones to assess the patient's visual gait. They are having reflective beats and on an app-based system, you can see the patient's gait. You can import the videos into different, different softwares and then see whether the patient is walking well and suggest the patient that, you know, these are the things that you need to focus on. These are the muscles you need to exercise. This is how you do it and then you will walk better. So overall, this is a very exciting time where technology is sort of, you know, 
uh, really getting involved along with real intelligence, maybe artificial intelligence to a certain extent, and a human uh, sort of mind at the end of it to operate that. So something that scares a lot of people is that you know a robot is going to operate, so there's no human mind in that. So it is not, uh, it is not. Um, so that uh, human is not behind it. It is ultimately a man or a surgeon who is operating the machine and who is telling it where it needs to go. So yes, it is married with the real intelligence and that's why they, uh, uh, this is a very good technology. So uh, you say, I already physiotherapy has become less aggressive in uh, uh, TKR surgeries. I would say, in, I, when I meant to say aggression, I meant to say the speed with which the, the physiotherapists are going from point 0.1 to point 0.2 to point 0.3. And it is because... Uh, uh, I'm no, I don't mean to say the force of aggression, I mean the, uh, the speed of aggression that you know on the third day you do the stairs, on the fifth day you start walking with the help of two sticks and by the end of the, let's say two weeks to three weeks the patient starts becoming independent which in the previous generation probably would take a slightly longer time. So I hope overall uh, this has been an informative session. We uh, as our experience increases, as we imbibe this technology, we would be coming up with our papers and our scientific data on uh, whatever ha we have been doing. And I would come back to you and uh, do more such sessions. And uh, the next session hopefully will be from the operation theater where we will show you the, the Cori as we call it, this uh, machine live in action to show you the degree of accuracy that we can achieve is absolutely unbelievable. It is about 2.1 to 0.2 millimeters of accuracy without damaging any of the soft issues. So we look forward to seeing you over there. If you have any questions, you can drop in the drop box. I would definitely get back to you. Thank you very much.